the portal this time of year is more beneficial to the top programs, but that's because I think the portal this time of year is always beneficial to the top programs. Not just this time of year, but in December as well. Like if you have playoffs and deep NIL resources, you're always going to be at a massive advantage, regardless of when the portal opens in April or when the portal opens in December. You're always a step ahead if you have crazy resources. Hello and welcome to Always College Football. I'm Greg McElroy. Appreciate you guys being with us. Today is Monday, April 15th. It's tax day. So a lot of us writing checks today in some cases, maybe some cases collecting checks. But either way, kind of a stressful day for all of us, but not so stressful if you're finished with your spring football responsibilities and a bunch of teams are. They were able to go on the field on Saturday. In some cases, had a real game-like scrimmage. In other cases, they had tug-of-wars, slam-dunk contests, and hot dog-eating contests. We'll tell you who had what here in just a bit. We're also going to naturally, at this point, with the portal opening in the next day, we're going to evaluate the possibility of whether or not these teams will add a player in the portal, and we'll probably get into this a little bit more. Portal's open for two weeks. So there's a lot of time to be able to get to it, but there were some glaring holes on a few different rosters this weekend that I think teams will try to address. Alongside, as always, Mark Kubiak, Jack Foster, and Jake Garcia. We appreciate all of you coming to us from wherever it is you're coming to us from, whether well, that's the ACF podcast. Wherever you get your podcast, you can download it, like, rate, and subscribe. Leave us a review if you want to. That's perfectly fine. If not, if you're here with us on the ESPN YouTube channel, Thanks for being with us, and please subscribe to the always to the ESPN College Football YouTube channel. For those of you that are unaware, I have a three-week-old, three weeks today uh, at home, so a little sleep-deprived voice after calling the Alabama spring game this past weekend. Still, maybe not in game shape, <laughs> trying to get it back a little bit, but a touch horse. So bear with us as we navigate throughout these spring game breakdowns next on Always College Football. Let's start in the Big Ten where the Ohio State Buckeyes were on display. All eyes naturally are going to be on Will Howard, right? The Kansas State transfer, veteran leader, the expectations that he would come right in, earn the starting job. I only feel like those expectations were reinforced when he went out there and took some snaps with the first team. And I thought his performance was very solid. Actually looking at kind of all the way the quarterbacks were kind of deployed, Brown, I thought, has clearly solidified himself as the backup. Uh, might keep push, pushing Will Howard. Maybe that's a possibility. That'd be great. I thought he had a particularly efficient performance. And Logan Keenholz, I thought he was pretty solid too. Eight of 11 for 63. Everyone wants to see Julian Sam, but it's so hard. I mean, it's so difficult to expect a true freshman to go in there and just light it up day one. But all in all, it was a good day, I thought, for the Buckeyes quarterbacks. Another thing that I was paying close attention to, and we know that Marvin Harrison's off to the NFL we know Ju Julian Fleming has since departed. He's a part of the Penn State program. So I was kind of curious. All right, let's look at the wide receiver spot. Uh, kind of knew that Igmek Igmuka is going to be awesome. <laughs> like We know that. That should not be a huge surprise to anybody. But he kind of got a little banged up last year. Didn't have some ridiculous numbers. But we know he's re really reliable when the game presents itself, especially in gotta-have-it situations. So feel really good about him. I also think the rest of the wideouts are going to be just fine. I look at Ohio State, man. They just have young guys galore that are going to be able to step right in and probably be, be able to play pivotal roles for this group, even though it feels like the running backs might be the stars of the show. Didn't get crazy amounts of carries or production from either of the two backs, both Travion Henderson and Quinshawn Judkins, we know they're going to get plenty of opportunities in the fall. One thing I was really encouraged by is the fact that the Ohio State offseason, a big part of the really the conversation has been how many guys were able to stay. The fact that 10 out of 14 players that played 300 plus snaps last year for the Buckeyes are all back, like JT Tuimolo, Jack Sawyer, Denzel Burke. 
Tyleek Williams, Lathan Ransom, Ty Hamilton, all those guys being back after finishing third nationally in total defense has got to give Jim Knowles, the defensive coordinator, a rock solid nucleus of players that will be able to go out and perform at a really high level. I also think too, if you listen to what's been said around the program the last couple of days, it sounds like the defense has been ahead of the offense up to this point of the spring practice. And that kind of held true. I mean, defense forcing turnovers, they were really disruptive. And I think the quarterbacks and even some of their most experienced personnel on the field at times had some struggles. It also was kind of refreshing to see some third down pressures, <laughs> which you don't see very often in the spring. And they gave, I thought, the offensive line for Ohio State some trouble, even though that group, for the most part, is really experienced. The only guy gone off that group is Matt Jones. That was the right guard. So I do think the offensive line still remains a position of concern. And if you look at the rest of the Ohio State roster, they are ready. I mean, they are ready to go and potentially win a national championship as long as that offensive line. We know the Big Ten, is a, that's a league that starts up front. Trench play is of the utmost importance. There are some question marks there. I do think the bright spot in the secondary was terrific. They had four picks in the spring game. Jalen McCl uh, McClain, Inky Jones, Dante Griffin, and Calvin Simpson hurt. They all recorded picks. And McLean's pick came off Julian Sayan with the Buckeye offense trying to run that two minute at the end of half. So I think there was a lot to like about what we saw from the secondary, but that should come as no surprise. That group will be among the best in the sport next year. All things considered, the only thing I want to figure out, the offensive line. That's pretty much it. The Buckeyes are in a great spot heading into summer camp. Penn State also on the field, and we were all interested, right? All of us. What's Andy Kotelnicki, the new offensive coordinator, what's he going to do? You know, all those motions and shifts and wacky formations. We didn't see any of that. <laughs> if they had run some of that, I might have called Andy and been like, dude, why are you showing so much? So they kept it very vanilla. And we didn't see a whole lot of creativity, if you will. But one thing I did see were a lot of absences. So if you're going to gauge what Penn State might look like this fall offensively based on what we saw on Saturday, I think we'd be following breadcrumbs that are going to lead us to nowhere. Nicholas Singleton, Catron Allen, they didn't play. Uh, Allen, his spring injury sounded like a little bit more of an issue perhaps than Singleton, but I'm not super concerned. They'll be fine. Saw the young backs as a result. The offensive line was almost impossible to figure out. Four potential starters all sat out. And Shelton, who might ultimately end up as a starting tackle, he was out for all of spring. Tyler Warren didn't play at tight end. So it, it's almost impossible. And people are going to come away from this and look at Drew Aller's numbers and say, oh, well, 15 of 32, 202. Didn't score really until the final minute of the game when you found a wide open wide receiver down the sideline for a touchdown. But I Y'all, he, he didn't have any of the things that he'll have in the fall to help him feel a little bit better and a little bit more efficient. So, yeah, while well, the numbers, you look at those, you're like, ah, I'd love for him to be a tad more efficient. Would like for him to average around nine or 10 yards an attempt as opposed to about six and a half. I, I'm not going to lose a lot of sleep over it. And I don't think you should either. I still think that there is some rust, perhaps, there was some wind certainly factored in, but I'm not worried about the progress made on that side of the ball. I have too much faith in Andy Kotelnicki being able to put those guys in a great spot. One notable absence, and it's been absent now for a couple of weeks, it sounds like Keandre Lambert-Smith has been away from the team for the last few days and is probably going to end at the transfer portal. And considering that he was the leader last year for the Nittany Lions, 53 catches, 673, and four touchdowns. Really had a nice game against West Virginia early in the year. But look at last year. He had 85 yards in four games. And I'm sure he thought maybe with the new offense, maybe he's going to get a little bit more leash. Maybe he's going to have a little more opportunities to do some different things. But with the additions of Julian Fleming and, and with what Harrison Wallace is becoming, who knows where Keandre Lambert-Smith might 
be in the pecking order. And based on all the different pieces that teams need at wide receiver, I would think he'd be highly coveted in the transfer portal if and when he hops in. One other notable takeaway was Abdul Carter, who is one of those guys that we're really interested in, opted to change positions. He was a linebacker. Now he's going to defensive end. Looks like he's certainly playing with the efficiency and the agility on the edge defensively that we always knew he had. He's around 250, 255. They say he feels pretty good at that weight, but this guy at times has been unblockable. So I was really curious to see how that was working out, and by all accounts, things are looking very good for him during that transition. As far as what they need to add in the portal, man, I think Penn State's in a really good spot. I mean, they really are. I think they're going to be really good at all three levels defensively. Would never hate for a little help along the offensive line, though. So if you can add a piece there, that would be tremendous. Let's go to the ACC. Boston College took to the field for the first time in the Bill O'Brien era. The running backs, I thought, looked pretty good. <laughs> when you look at some of the other guys, look, we know what Robicho, we know Broom, we know what those guys can do. Broom, by the way, brace on his left leg. And on crutches, those guys didn't play. But we got to take a good look at Treshawn Ward, transfer from Florida State. We got to see UCF transfer Jordan McDonald, who I thought looked pretty good. We also got to see Detrell Jones. Those all showed potential. And you also look, too, at the wide receiver spot, a bunch of new faces there as well. Lewis Bond was unavailable, but Jaden Skeet hauled in a couple touchdown passes from Castellanos. And in the final minute, you have that six foot five, 220 pound transfer from Texas Tech, Jaron Bradley, who they are very excited about. And the transfer from Vanderbilt, Jaden McGowan, who's a slot receiver, a little undersized, but still really, really solid. And Luke McLaughlin, those guys might all have significant contributions here in what should be a new look offense for the Eagles. Georgia Tech, they had one of the worst defenses in the country last year. Okay. Well, Brent Key went to the portal, responded by overhauling the defensive staff, bringing in a bunch of transfers to help address some of the problems on that side of the ball. Now, while they didn't address every question that we had going into the spring, it does look like to me the linebackers look a little bit better. There were fewer missed tackles. Uh, they did a pretty good job in their run fits, which I think is encouraging. So the trifecta of Hamilton, Butler, and Eford they should be in a really good spot. So I'm very encouraged by some of the additions they've made on the defensive side. So hopefully Georgia Tech, we know they can run the ball. We know they're going to be explosive offensively, but will they be a little better on the defensive side? It looks like based on their spring scrimmage, they've taken strides on that side of the ball. Pittsburgh was also on the field and the roster was a bit choppy. To say the least, they were drafting guys. And really, with this, I just wanted to see their quarterback play. God's honest truth. I just wanted to see what Nate Yarnell looked like. I thought he was sharp. I uh, wouldn't say he went above and beyond. Uh, but at the same time, I also have to take into account what they were last year at the quarterback spot in particular. And I think Yarnell looks like a significant upgrade over anybody that was under center for the Panthers last season. Now, he finished the day 12 of 16, 108, and a touchdown. But he did open the game with eight straight completions and looked really comfortable while making some of those throws. So I know it was a patchwork offensive line. I know the wide receivers were kind of mixed all over the place, so we didn't get the best evaluation of the offense as a whole. But I am encouraged with the growth I've seen at the quarterback spot. A place that doesn't need growth at the quarterback spot that much is at Virginia Tech because we know Kyron Trones is going to be great this year. And he picked up right where he left off last season. Went right down the field early, was 6 for 10 for 122 and a couple touchdown passes. I also think, too, he moved around in the pocket and made some nice throws, made some nice reads. And if he plays as well in the fall as he did in the spring, this offense is going to put up a lot of points this upcoming season. But over the last eight games of the year, and against the bowl game, against Tulane, the defense was a big reason why they ended up winning six of their last nine. And I thought the defense really did a pretty good job, especially when you consider along the line of scrimmage, they were pretty active. They had some guys that were able to get past and get around and create a few pressures. Uh, also thought that Dorian Strong had the pick of drones there in the end zone in the first quarter. I thought the defense looked good. 
as probably anyone could have hoped, given all the experience and all the playmakers that are back on the offensive side of the football. The other thing that stood out too, notably, when we've watched Virginia Tech in recent years, the depth hasn't been where you want it to be. When they would sub guys out, the twos would go in for the ones to give them a little rest. It noticed it noticeably dropped off in some areas. It doesn't feel like this year's version of the Hokies is going to drop off quite as much. So it does look like Brent Pry and his staff have done a great job of going and adding transfer portal talent. And some of the freshmen and younger guys look like they're progressing nicely with their development. So yeah, they, they are still not in a position where they can overcome a ton of injuries, but you got to feel a little better with the depth that I've seen both offensively and defensively for the first time in the Brent Pry era and the first time, frankly, in a while. They're in Blacksburg, Virginia. Miami, the biggest takeaway here is that Miami's got a dude at quarterback. Right? We had talked last week about the, quote, competition that was going on at the quarterback spot at Miami. But come on, man, we know it's Cam Ward's team. And he only solidified that more with his performance in the spring game. He had 300 plus yards of the year. The secondary did not look good, I might add. But still, when you look at Ward to go 19 to 24 for 324, no picks, which was huge because think about what Miami was last year when they didn't turn the ball over, they could play with anybody. But when they did, they became very human very quickly. Well, Ward was out there with the first team offense and I thought did a great job hitting Restrepo on a couple of chunk plays. Hitting think uh, uh Richard didn't tackle very well, but he broke free. Restrepo did against Richard and just ran up the sidelines. So I do think that the coverage in the back end is something I'd be a little concerned about. But at the same time, man, this offense appears ready to go. And if I'm Miami, I'm probably looking in the portal a little bit for some veteran defenders there in the back end because I was very disappointed with the tackling at times that I saw from that side of the ball. In the Big 12, still weird for me to say this, Utah is on the field this past Saturday for their spring game, and Cam Rising is officially back. Looked completely in control, 15-19, to 19, about 210 yards, a couple touchdowns, including a beautiful 57-yard deep ball, two money parks for the touchdown, which was probably the best play of the game. They connected multiple times throughout the game, picking up right where they left off back at the end of the 2022 season. And the one thing that people have said all throughout camp as the offense just feels different with Cam rising out there. How could it not be? He's played a ton of football. We know he's got great feel for the position, great feel for the offense. We know his decision-making is going to be qu quick and crisp, and there's a reason why he's taking Utah to two Pac-12 title games. But the biggest thing I was looking at was Dorian Singer, and he is as advertised. He could very well end up as the number one wide receiver there for the Utes, and he played great leading all receivers with 92 yards on five receptions. It's going to be amazing to see exactly how this passing attack continues to develop. It was great to see Brant Keithy back out there, even though still non-contact. But him, along with Money Parks, along with Dorian Singer, it's going to be huge for them as they move forward. The one area that I was a little interested in was their run game. And we didn't get to see a whole lot of that. They threw it 58 times in the game and ran just 27 times. But Mike Bernard was stuffed on both of his rushing attempts. Mike Mitchell had five carries for 16 yards. Dijon Stanley maybe had the best run of the day, bouncing it to the outside for a decent game, but there wasn't a whole lot of room there in the run game. So I will be watching that closely as they move forward because I don't think Utah is going to be in a position, even with Cam rising back, to be a pass-happy style of attack, even though their personnel on the perimeter and their personnel at quarterback would certainly justify moving a little bit in that direction. Moving into the SEC, the Alabama Crimson Tide were on the field this past Saturday. I was very fortunate to be on the call and to get a good look at just how different this team might be from where they were last year. Of course, Nick Saban no longer patrolling the sidelines, but he was there on the sideline there before the game. Molly McGrath got to visit with him, and he went up to the booth and watched the game from up there with a roster in hand. So it's got to be uncomfortable for him to not have direct involvement there on the spring game. But either way, it's hard to take a lot away from this performance. I, I watched it over again, and I kind of feel the same way I felt 
when I was up there in the booth calling it alongside Dave Patch. I thought, let's start with uh, Jalen uh, Milrow. I thought he made two really nice throws, both to Jeremy Bernard. One was on the seam route to the left-hand side. That was on the first drive. One was a little bit later over a defender on an over route where he threw it into a perfect location. I thought those were two really good throws. Now, the numbers aren't going to jump off the page, but those were two throws that he might not have made last year. Big-time throws, and there were some drops. There were some missed assignments offensively. So it's hard to look at the numbers and have a huge takeaway with how he impacted the game through the year, plus some of the things that he does great. Take off and run, moving in the pocket, extending plays, making guys miss. You can't do that when you're in a non-contact jersey. He did have one run early, but that was for the most part it. One revelation at the quarterback spot, though, was Ty Simpson's development. A lot of people thought he would enter the portal after the season last year. He ended up sticking around, and he is really looking comfortable in this new offense led by offensive coordinator Nick Sheridan. Really accurate, really decisive, got the ball out quickly, missed two or three throws. But for the most part, I thought he played faster this year than at any point last year, both in spring, summer, and then ultimately throughout the fall. The running back position remains a position of strength. Jam Miller was named the MVP. He had 83 yards and a couple touchdowns. And overall, the top three running backs, Jam Miller, Justice Haynes, and Richard Young, they all combined for 122 yards and four touchdowns. He also saw true freshman Daniel Hill get in there as well. But either way, they're really in a good spot at running back. The question I had was at wide receiver. And I think Jeremy Bernard, him transferring from Washington to Alabama, we knew he was an exceptional playmaker. We knew he was a very versatile weapon. For those that have watched Georgia the last couple of years, I've always felt like Jeremy Bernard's skill set was very comparable to that of Dylan Bell. If you wanted to hand it to him between the tackles at running back, he could probably handle that. But him now transitioning exclusively to wide receiver is going to be huge, and he might ultimately end up being the number one wideout for this Crimson Tide team. The depth at wide receiver is good. I think they have top-end speed, and that's even before the arrival of Ryan Williams, the five-star freshman who will arrive on campus here in just a couple weeks, was paying close attention to the tackle position. I thought they held up pretty well. And considering a lot of eyes were on Elijah Pritchett and the fact that Caden Proctor is transferring back to the Crimson Tide, that position might go from a huge question mark to a position you feel pretty good about here overnight. The one area that would be concerning, especially when looking at the rushing numbers, for Alabama would be the defensive line. And they were playing without Jaheim Otis. And he is potentially an all-SEC, maybe even an all-American contender. So his absence was notable. You've got to take a good look at some of the depth behind him. And I do think finding more depth along the defensive line is always of significance. So don't be surprised if Bama maybe looks at the portal of a great D tackle or if a nose jumps in the portal. Maybe they roll the dice and try to bring him on campus. The edge rushers were also a position I was paying close attention to. When you lose Dallas, Braz uh, Dallas Turner and Chris Braswell, you know that that's a pretty significant void. They feel good about their depth on the edges, and I think they have versatility at those positions, like Keanu Cott, who's got great speed, Quay Rousseau, who they feel great about, the veteran leadership of Quindarius Robinson. Those guys should be in a really good spot there on the edges as well, but it's maybe not as deep as they've been in the past when all three of those guys served as backups to potential first and second round players in Dallas Turner and Chris Braswell. Linebackers, the strength of their team, arguably, with Deontay Lawson and Jihad Campbell. And then in the back end, Damani Jackson's going to lock down one corner spot. Malachi Moore at safety. Keon Sab, the transfer from Michigan at the other safety. I think that safety tandem is going to be excellent as we fast forward into the season. The big question remains, who's going to ultimately be the nickel or the Husky position, which is very important in this defense? Will it be a guy that maybe they add in the portal? Will it be a freshman? And who's going to be the second corner? Those will be the areas that I'll be watching closely throughout the summer and in particular throughout portal season, which opens up here for the next two weeks. The Arkansas Razorbacks were also on the field, and the first-team offense, I thought, did some really nice things. Taylor Green, the transfer from Boise State, had two very efficient touchdown drives, went a combined 9 of 11 on those two drives for 100 yards. In the first possession, 
ended with a 10-yard touchdown pass to Tyrone Broden, who was the red team's leading receiver with five catches for 60 yards. The other guy I was paying close attention to was Jaquindon Jackson, transfer from Utah. He actually led all Arkansas running backs with 65 rushing yards on nine carries and a couple of rushing touchdowns. He's a big, physically imposing back that can get downhill. So I think Arkansas might get back to the ground and pound a little more than we saw those, well, we saw at times two years ago and kind of sporadically last year. The defense... Not sure I can gain a whole lot just yet. And while Sam Pitton praised some of the individuals on defense, I still am not yet confirming that they're going to be way better than they were the year before. So got to watch that group closely early in the season. And maybe they add a couple pieces there in the front seven defensively when they move here in the portal in a couple weeks. Florida, the big thing I was looking at was who's going to replace Ricky Pearsaw. Right. Who's going to replace Ricky Pearsaw? He's so good. He was so reliable last year. And it appears like they've found that replacement. Eugene Wilson, who put together a great year last year as a true freshman. He was explosive, picking up 128 yards and a touchdown on 12 catches, including a 60-yard touchdown in the second quarter. Caught kind of a mid-range pass and then exploded past the defenders for 30 yards after the catch. So I think Wilson is well positioned to be the leading receiver for this team and fill what I think was a significant void being left by Ricky Pearsaw, who might end up hearing his name called in the first round of the NFL draft. Now, I do think Florida leaves the spring with some serious needs across the roster. I think depth at wide receiver is huge. I also think they need to find some more bodies along the defensive front. And then finally, as a little bonus, who wasn't paying attention to DJ Lagway? <laughs> I mean, who wasn't? Now he's a five-star, blue-chip, can't-miss prospect. And he was there leading the second-team offense. I thought he did a pretty good job. A couple touchdowns, didn't have the pick. But he's very sharp for a guy that's this early in his career. Hitting some deep balls, leaning on some touch down the field that we had heard about all throughout his recruiting and, and his process of deciding where he ultimately was going to end up. So in the event in which Graham Mertz has to miss a little time, in the event in which Graham Mertz is, is out or, or whatever it may be, hopefully that doesn't happen because I think Mertz is obviously excellent and very efficient in his own right. They have to feel pretty good about the depth at quarterback and the upside that we saw from the freshman DJ Lagway. Georgia... One thing that I think I'm most encouraged by in watching their spring game, and we had talked, and I know the numbers. People will look at the numbers for Georgia defensively, and they'll say, well, man, they're top five in every category that you could want, including third downs, against the run. There's a lot of stuff to like about what Georgia did defensively statistically last year. But when you watched Georgia, and you have to watch them, watch them closely and watch the tape, I never – in 21 and 22, saw Georgia defenders getting moved off the ball. I never saw that, ever. And yet, last year, there were multiple times in which Georgia was not winning along the line of scrimmage defensively. Well, here's the good thing. I thought they were going against one of the best offenses in America led by Carson Beck this past weekend, and they looked really good, including Michael Williams who is making the switch to outside linebacker. He tipped a Carson Beck pass and picked it off. C.J. Allen was really good there in the middle of the defense, had an interception of his own. Gabe Harris was all over the place. Aguero looked really solid at nickelback. There were a lot of really good moments defensively for the Georgia Bulldogs, and mostly with Williams, knowing that he's playing a new spot. He's got length, he's athletic, and we know that he can be a massive difference maker when he's healthy. Well, he certainly looks healthy now. Last year, missed so much time throughout spring, missed so much time throughout summer, and really didn't get into game shape until week seven or eight. Well, he's ready to go right now. And that was without some key starters defensively for Georgia. Malachi Starks didn't play. Small Munden didn't play. Tyrion Ingram Dawkins didn't play. They're going against an offense like that, and they played that well. I'm very encouraged by what I saw from the Georgia Bulldogs on the defensive side. That's a huge, huge relief, I think, for Kirby Smart 
and his staff on evaluating what they can be as a balanced football team in 2024. The Kentucky Wildcats played with some tempo. <laughs> they went, they got going a little bit, which is not something that they've done in the past, but all eyes were on Brock Vandegrift. The new starting quarterback looked as good as you could possibly want in his first time playing in front of fans. He found Dane Key on a nice touchdown pass in the back corner of the end zone on the second drive of the day. Capped the scrimmage with another touchdown pass to tight end Kamari Anderson. So we knew that he had great arm talent. I mean, he's a five-star recruit. <laughs> but he also kind of showcased that athleticism that we always knew he had as well. There were a few times in which he had to evade, a few times in which he had to move and buy time and to extend plays. And it appears like there might even be some wrinkles as far as quarterback run is concerned as well, too. So with new OC Bush Hamden, I don't think they're going to show us a whole lot. We probably got a small sliver of what they might want to do offensively. But I was very encouraged by what I saw from Brock Vandegrift and the offense after they were so up and down and so inconsistent last year. The Tennessee Volunteers, we know who they are. Okay, We know they want to run tempo, they want to get vertical, and we know that they put an awful lot on the quarterback position. And Nico Iamaleava started the game and I thought played pretty well. Now it was highlighted by that touchdown pass to Chase and Chaz Nimrod there in the corner of the end zone, but he looked composed. And you know, man, this guy's got the weight of the world on his shoulders as far as the expectations are concerned. I thought all the quarterbacks for Tennessee are in a pretty good spot, but Iamaleava is the guy that everybody's looking up at right there on Rocky Top. One area that was, I guess, a little bit concerning was that they didn't necessarily run the ball the way that they did at, at times in 2023. But the good news is there, they're going against their defensive line. And we know that defensive line is really, really good. And the offensive line was without several starters. So it was kind of hard to get a real gauge on what they're going to be running the football to take some of the pressure off of Ia Maleava and that passing attack. You know they're going to be balanced. You know they're going to probably lean a little more towards the run maybe early in the year, but they couldn't get a whole lot going. That's a real testament. The defensive line, which is going to be anchored by an all-SEC contender in James Pierce, and that should be maybe the strength of the team here coming into 2024. One part that was a big part of the storylines for Tennessee coming into the spring was the secondary. And I, it might be the biggest question mark. I mean, depending on who you ask, it might be the biggest question mark. And if you kind of look at some of the answers that you might have gotten this past weekend, you know, Jermon McCoy and Ricky Gibson, they started at cornerback. We know that Jacoby Thomas and John Slaughter are going to get the nod at safety and Jordan Thomas started at the star position. So maybe if you're if you're looking at that, you kind of know who are the guys going into the summer. So to have some clarity there is beneficial. So we'll be watching that group considerably because they're going to need to develop depth at those positions as well. LSU and redshirt junior quarterback Garrett Nussmeyer, who has waited his turn, he's entering the fall with some ridiculous weapons. I <laughs> mean, you get CJ Daniels, the transfer from Liberty. And if you look at that playmaking ability, the route running, the separation, C.J. Daniels is going to be a huge difference maker in this offense alongside Kyron Lacey. Now, we all know that Kyron Lacey is going to be great. Aaron Anderson's got great speed. Shelton Sampson was targeted a few times in the passing game, and Garrett Nussmeyer was kind of able to pick and choose who he wants to go with and where he's going to want to go on Saturday. Now, I'm going to be curious to see what happens on the defensive side. I still think there's a lot of question marks over there. And I love Blake Baker, and it's their first time in front of a crowd where they're having to play a new coverage, and they probably didn't scheme up a whole lot of things for their offense, and they're probably not gonna try to attack their offense and things like that. Everyone wants to look good, play vanilla coverage, don't show anybody anything for the fall. But man, they were busting coverages. Like, how are they busting coverages when they're playing vanilla defense? There were gaps given up in the run game. There's a lot of work, I think, to be done on that side of the ball. So I think the big takeaway from this past weekend, though, defensively, is that it does appear like the early enrollee, Gabriel Relaford, he might be in a great position to align himself with the first team when 
the fall opens up. Now, is he going to be a day one starter? But we've seen day one freshmen jump in and be game changers. Look at Ruben Bain last year for Miami. It can happen. And Relaford, he finished the day a couple sacks, a bunch of quarterback hurries. So maybe he can be a key piece on the edge this year for them and a guy that maybe you can kind of build a defense around. So that was one encouraging aspect. But man, I'd like to have seen a cleaner performance defensively from LSU during their spring game. Let's head into our mailbag where we have a few Twitter questions that y'all have submitted at always CFB on both Twitter and on Instagram. So submit your questions. We'll get to them. We're going to probably have a mailbag segment almost every single show from here on out. So submit your questions. and We look forward to answering those questions to the best of our ability. Coops, where are we going today? First one comes from a dog fan, and he asks, has UGA improved their ability to get pressure and sacks on opposing QBs? Well, here's the thing with Georgia, is applying pressure has never been a problem. I mean, they are always going to rush the quarterback and hopefully stop the run and route to the quarterback. That is Kirby Smart's philosophy. He wants his guys to play violent. He wants his guys to rip off the edge. And it was obvious last year. I mean, we called a couple of their games. When you watch Georgia, Michael Williams, the guy that we saw at the end of 2022, never looked like the guy that we saw at the end of that year throughout 2023, but it's because he was completely banged up and the guy was never really in a position to train the way he wanted to train in the offseason. Well, they've now changed his position. Like I said, he's got great length. He's crazy athletic. He's super twitchy. He can hold up at the point. I think his emergence is going to be massive this year. And he's a guy that I think everyone is sleeping on going into these preseason All-American prognostications. My biggest question for Georgia has not been about their ability to rush the passer and to affect the opposing quarterback. My biggest concern is last year they got gashed on the ground more so than I ever remember seeing a Kirby Smart defense get gashed. And I'm not talking like tricky plays. I'm talking stretch zone. Watch the Missouri game. Look at how the Missouri was able to apply pressure to the point there on the edges of the defense and push guys off the ball. Watch the Alabama game and look at how many times Georgia defenders were getting pushed backwards at the point of attack. That is not something I'm used to. So if I look at Georgia, my concerns are not with how they get after the opposing quarterback. My concerns are on first down. Will they not give up six and a half yards rushing against a team that's really committed to running stretch zone and to running zone read? Because if you look to it, their zone read numbers last year, they were near the bottom. I think they gave up six yards a carry on zone read going into the bowl game, which is not something I'm used to seeing from a Kirby Smart-led defense. All right, this next one's great in regards to the Ole Miss spring game or spring contest, whatever you want to call it. Z17, will more teams adapt Ole Miss format or is this a one-and-done attempt? Well, I think it's an interesting thought, right? Because spring games can be super valuable. I mean, they can be super about you. You have your young players in front of a crowd. It's the most game-like atmosphere you'll experience all off season. You might have 400, 500 friends and family members in attendance in the scrimmages. You'll have your fan day in the fall, but those aren't comparable to what you're going to experience when you walk into the stadium and you're dealing with crowd noise and things like that. So I do think a mock game can be really valuable. But I also think mock games can work against you. And one example was with what Texas had to deal with last year. And Texas last year had a backup quarterback back named Malik Murphy, who has since transferred to Duke. And Malik Murphy went out in the spring game and balled out. I mean, absolutely balled out. So guess what happens after that? Everyone and their brother is calling Malik Murphy's people and like, hey, man, uh, if you want to jump in the portal, we might have a home for you. So if you have a guy that flashes like that, that's not in line to be a starter in the fall, maybe they'll leave much like Malik Murphy did prior to the Sugar Bowl game last year. So that, I think, can work against you. But at the same time, man, I thought it was fun. And spring games are essentially supposed to be fun. 
and you don't want to show anything and you don't want guys to get hurt, right? I mean, that's the last thing you want in spring. Goal of the spring is don't get anybody hurt. Well, it's hard to get hurt during a, you know, a hot dog eating contest. Uh, it's hard to get hurt during a tug of war. Uh, it is possible to get hurt during a slam dunk contest, but probably not as likely to get hurt throwing it down as you would be in the trenches working against your offensive and defensive lines. So I do think that, look, Lane Kiffin's going to be creative. He's going to think of it in a different way. He's going to create competition. But at the same time, he also didn't want any of his backups to potentially shine and then ultimately get in the portal and go elsewhere after the spring. So I think it was a thoughtful way of maybe doing it moving forward. And I wouldn't be surprised if more teams kind of go in this direction here in the years to come. It shows personality. The guys were having fun. And frankly, it was just a glorified way of showcasing your program and looking how much fun we have being good. That I think resonates with the modern player. And uh, like I said, I think these are here to stay and we'll see more like it in the future. I love it. I thought it was very fun. Uh, the next question comes from Brendan Ryan. Do you feel the spring portal is more beneficial to mid-tier Power 4 programs? Top 15 programs rarely add that many starters in April. See, here's the problem with this thought is that, yes, would a mid-tier program be more likely to get a plug-and-play starter? Yes, that's, that's absolutely possible. But is it also possible that a mid-tier program could lose a bona fide starter to a top-tier program, a top 10, top 12, top 15 team en route to chase a playoff? And I think a lot of this portal window, I think a lot of this portal window will center around creating depth. You kind of already know what you have and you got to kind of dance with who brung you at this point. But at the same time, creating depth at certain positions is incredibly valuable. And I think the top tier programs will always be in a position because of their NIL resources to bring in depth more so than the mid tier or the G5 programs. So I actually think the portal this time of year is more beneficial to the top programs. But that's because I think the portal this time of year is always beneficial to the top programs, not just this time of year, but in December as well. Like if you have playoffs and deep NIL resources, you're always going to be at a massive advantage, regardless of when the portal opens in April or when the portal opens in December. You're always a step ahead if you have crazy resources. So if Ohio State says, you know what, we really need to add a tackle, we have we can raise $700,000 to go get a starting tackle. Yeah, a lot of starting tackles are going to think strongly about jumping and playing for the Buckeyes because of the resources that they have at their disposal as far as NIL is concerned. A couple of news and notes from the weekend. Texas A&M, unfortunately, has lost one of their top players for an extended period of time at wide receiver. Jabre Barber has undergone surgery to repair a foot injury and is expected to miss several months. Now, he transferred to a and from Troy and had really been impressive before the injury and might have even emerged as a potential number one wide receiver, but he also would have been a huge contributor as a punt returner as well. Had 75 catches for 999 yards and five touchdowns at Troy last year and was an all-Sun Belt selection for the 11-win Troy Trojans. We saw an injury. Now, I'm not a doctor, but Juice Wells at South Carolina – had an injury where he had to get, you know, some time off and a, and a little surgery perhaps last year in the summer, and he was never really able to do anything last year for the Gamecocks. So here's hoping that Jabre Barber will be able to recover from this surgery, miss the time that they're expecting him to miss, and hopefully can get back on the field for the Aggies sometime very, very soon. And when he does return, he'll be at or near 100% because he can clearly be an impact player for the Aggies. Mississippi State also landed a massive commitment from Miami, Ohio. Rashad Amos was on an official visit this past weekend. He's the number three ranked prospect 
in the 247 transfer portal rankings. He had a thousand yard year last year with the Red Hawks. And I think that now he's jumping in to the portal and going to play for Jeff Levy, which is an offense that while it might look really fun as far as throwing the football, it's all centered around being able to run the football. He actually has some SEC experience. He started his career with South Carolina back in 2020. Wasn't a huge recruit, but he's six foot two, 234 yards, and already has over a thousand yards on his resume last year while averaging over five yards per carry. We know Mississippi State's been super active in the portal since Jeff Levy arrived. So he joins a group that includes Blake Shapin, who transferred in from Baylor at quarterback, a couple of receivers and Kevin Coleman and Kelly Akinari, and two tight ends in Cameron Ball and Justin Ball. So a bunch of offensive linemen as well. So we know that Mississippi State's still going to be very active in the portal, I would imagine, in this portal season as well. And they might have just landed a really physical downhill back that should suit them well in that tempo offense. That'll do it for us here at Always College Football. Continue to ask all of you to like, rate, and subscribe to the show wherever you get your show. If that's on the podcast, if you're on Apple Podcasts, if you're on Spotify, leave us a rating, leave us a review. It means a lot to us and know that we very much appreciate all that you have done for us here at Always College Football. You can follow us on social media at Always CFB on both Instagram and on Twitter. And you can follow me at Greg McElroy on Twitter and Instagram as well. So for all of us here at Always College Football, for Mark, Jake, Jack, the other Jack, I'm Greg. We hope you have a wonderful day. And remember, it's Always College Football. Hey guys, it's Greg McElroy. Thanks for watching Always College Football. Make sure you like, rate, and subscribe to ESPN's YouTube channel and wherever you listen to your podcasts.